Good evening and welcome to another episode of Nigeria Politics Weekly. As usual, my name is Michael and co-hosting with me is Phoenix. Today, we have two guests. Our first guest is Ose Aneni. Ose is a hotelier, a member of the PDP, and in particular, a member of the PDP's e-registration committee. Our second guest is Haruna. Haruna is a doctor, and in particular, is a psychiatrist, probably helpful for Nigerian politics. And Haruna is from the northeast of Nigeria. Now, the three topics we're we'll discussing today are firstly, a number of northern states in Nigeria have been put on lockdown. Schools have been shot, and in some instances, mobile phone connection has been shut down. Secondly, we'll be discussing Buhari's decision to fire two of his ministers. And thirdly, we'll be discussing the crisis in the PDP, the People's Democratic Party. Now to our first topic, Northern States and lockdown. Um, Phoenix, I was reading the news today, it seems 30 boarding schools in Adamawa have been closed down. The reports that also in Zamfara State, mobile connection has been cut off. In Kaduna State, schools have been shut down, especially in the southern, southern part. So what, what is going on, Phoenix? Hi, Michael, and hi, um, Use and uh, Haruna, thanks for joining us. Hello, listeners. Um, I, I think number one is an admission that uh, we truly have an insecurity crisis and, and a government that has had its head buried in the sand for quite a while has finally decided to live up to its responsibility, albeit uh, it, it might, it, it's come very, very late and at a very significant cost with, with lives and property, a lot of people that have been lost, a lot of people that have been displaced and, and all of that across the north. Um, from the northeast where, of course, it was always a challenge um, from as far back as, I mean, 10 years ago that we, we've had the Boko Haram crisis um, to north uh, central um, uh, and northwest, of course, we've had the Kaduna issues but then you then had banditry take over in, in places like Katsina and, and Zamfar. So now, I mean, the government seems to be trying to do something. That's that's how I read it. And, and having accepted that, yes, they have lost control. Um, I mean, shutting down the schools makes sense. I mean, if you can't secure children and they keep getting kidnapped, might as well ask them to stay at home. Of course, there is the... There is the um, danger to that and, and the potential loss this generation of kids will suffer and, and the fact that the, the setback that this means. But first, first it's important to secure lives. Uh, and I think, I mean, that's, that's what this is supposed to achieve. The discussion around the telecoms um, lockdown gives me more cause for pause because, I mean, we, we've seen... This is not the first time it's happened. And I mean, despite the fact that, of course, some data showed that during the period that it happened, this was in 2013, that the government decided to do a, a blanket uh, telecoms shutdown in the North um, for about two months. Um, there was, of course, a dip in the activities of Boko Haram, but after they lifted it, they, they came right back up again, showing that nothing sustainable was achieved. And that's what I think will happen again in these two weeks that they're talking about. I mean, what's more worrisome for me is, you know, we've, we, I mean, 2013 to today is a different type of Nigeria. We've become more dependent on, on telecoms um, without the ability for people to get the word out. There will be no information on what's truly going on and the potential um, human rights abuses that follow this kind of things. Um, and you're not, you're not even sure that, I mean, the, the, the people you're fighting against, they clearly have seen this happen before and they probably may be prepared. And in any case, you've announced it and they know what's happening and what it's for. So we'll see. I mean, I would have thought that, I mean, using the telecoms to, to really, you know, 
getting to 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 learn more about these people will be the, the right thinking way to go about it but i mean they seem to have other ideas we'll see what it what it what it achieves but it, it just shows to me that it's i mean the insecurity issues in nigeria have gotten to a head and something drastic needed to be done we've on this podcast talked about it several times i mean the lackadaisical approach the um, claiming victory where it was very clear that they haven't achieved anything and uh if this now means that they are making a strong push, as I hear that uh, the number of operations by the military in the North ongoing at the moment, if this brings some lasting positive effect, then I'm all for it. But we've seen, we've seen them do things like this before and uh, uh, I'm not entirely convinced. So we'll wait to see what happens, but I'm, I'm, more, I'm more worried about the, the, the outcomes of this and the potential negative impact on the people who are already suffering uh, very much from from the insecurity situation and the government that that has shown an inability to address it. Thank you, Phoenix. Um, also, Phoenix has obviously highlighted the fact that insecurity is an issue, and on the plus side, perhaps this might help to, to, to at least minimize the attacks. But my question for you is, what is the PDP's response? Does the PDP agree that this is the best way to address insecurity? Or as Phoenix has said, uh, he would have thought that with telecoms, it's better to leave them open so you can actually listen to the conversations that the bandits are having rather than shutting down telecommunications. That's what the Phoenix is implying. But, but what, what, what do you think, what is the PDP's position on this? So um, specifically to this recent rush of um, school shutdowns, um, the PDP hasn't taken a position, but in, you know, in the, to the general conversation around the way we've handled or the way this government has handled um, the security, issues. I think we have been very, very critical um, simply because, it, it, and maybe not particularly in the way man, man the military has prosecuted the, the security issues in the Northeast and Northwest, but almost, you know, in the confused um, prioritization of national security issues, this government seems to um, have chosen. You know, so you get the sense, for instance, that uh, Anandi Kano is more of a national security threat to this government than bandits in the Northwest and Boko Haram in the Northeast. And the same thing with Sunday Boho and um, his agitation for the Odudua Republic. And, and, you know, this, the problem with this confused prioritization of, of threats is that you then deploy resources in a way and manner that renders um, your fight against insecurity ineffective. And that has been the, the government position. And, you know, just, just to, to jump on what um, Phoenix said, you know, this is, hasn't even be a, been a government response in, in the true sense of the word. These school shutdowns have been done by state governments, not by the federal. And, you know, you worry whether there has been coordination with the federal before these decisions were reached, um, it, you you sort of are seeing a domino uh, effect where one state you know orders a shutdown, and the next state, I think the latest we've had today is Adamawa um, has also announced some school closures um, of boarding houses. And my concern is that if you don't have a coordinated response, then how effective uh, can it be? Almost seems like putting a bandaid on on a leaking dam. It seems that that's the approach were taken. And I, and I think it, it's more of an indictment of the federal government's inability to secure the states, you know, that states are now forced to say, you know what, since we, we ourselves don't control armed troops, it's better to just shut down the schools because the federal cannot secure them, and we definitely cannot. So I, I don't see it as progress. I think it's, it's disappointing. I know that we had this safe school initiative that, you know, took into account these um, growing you know security threats to education in particular and had devised you know ways and means to you know secure kids while they receive an education you know and shutting schools isn't that yes the kids are safe but then you you deny them of of, of an education 
Um, you know, and, and it also then even goes to the telecom shutdown. Again, it wasn't a federal uh, decision. It was a state governor who wrote, I think, to the Minister of Communications requesting that, you know, telecom be shut down, which I found was very curious. You know, you know, it was curious to me that it's a state governor that sort of like is leading security tactics and strategy at that level. Um, and again, it, it, it's, it's doubly concerning to, for me that, you know, we are not seeing, because I was asking what's, what law is backing this, uh, what regulations have been, have been put into effect, you know, and I, and I don't want to be an, an alarmist, but if it's so easy to shut down a state, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it isn't beyond the realm of possibility to think that, you know, further down the line, you know, governments, state governments, and even the federal can shut down the internet, shut down telecommunications in the interest of national security since this president has been set and hasn't been challenged by anyone. Thank you, Ose. Um, I just want to ask a quick follow-up question because um, whilst you raised some valid points, you, you did say the PDP doesn't have a position yet on this issue, but is that not a problem? The leading opposition party uh, these lockdowns have taken place over the past few days. So is, is that not a problem that they don't seem to have a position on them? I think, I, I think it's, it's not something that the, the party would, should be encouraged to react to for the sake of reacting. Adamawa, for instance, as you will know, is a PDP governed state. Um, so it, it's, not, it's not an opposition or ruling party issue. It's, it's a national security issue. And I think all sides are looking at, you know, on, the unfortunate reality that kids in schools are not secure. And I, I think instead of just opposing for the sake of opposing, and the, the PDB should be able to put forward possible solutions that will keep the kids secure um, whilst um, ensuring that they get an education. And, and I mentioned one such policy, the Safe Schools Initiative. Um, it's something backed by the U United Nations and UNICEF. It's something that we support and it's something that we would encourage um, this government to look at. Uh, it's expensive, but it's, it, at, at least, I, I don't think you can really put a price on, on, you know, on, on getting these, these young kids an education. Um, it's one of the reasons I think why the Northeast and the Northwest um, are particularly deviled by this level of insecurity. You know, and, and this really makes me, you know, it, it concerns me that, you know, as, as well-intentioned as these um, decisions are, it concerns me that um, we are just sort of like, um, it, it concerns me that we are just sort of like worsening, you know, the situation. Thank you, Jose. Well, I presume that was the PDP chairman uh, calling Uche Sekundus. <laughs> yes, because tell him we're going to be discussing him soon, so he should he should wait. But yes, on to thank you, Jose. On to Haruna. I don't know if you're still uh, with us. The I know you're from the northeast. Now, Jose and Felix have highlighted the uh, the, the failings of the Buhari government in terms of uh, security, securing lives and property. But I know you're from the region and you've got family members and, and friends there. So what, what, are the, what are the implications of children not going to school or schools being shot indefinitely because we cannot secure the area? I don't know. All right, um, thank you for, well, um, and for having me on the show. And I think um, coming to your question of um, if what's the implications of children not going to school, you know, because of the crisis, I suppose um, we need to look at it in a few ways. Um, first of all, um, one, why has this decision been taken? Have they got new information that, you know, we are not privy to about maybe impending attacks or things like that? So obviously the... Um, the states have the DSS and other um, security agencies who they have information and sometimes also have, um, when I say intelligence from even within the groups carrying out these attacks as to if there's something imminent, then they have to react. Whilst it may seem reactive, but I think as they say, it's better um, safe than sorry. You know, it's not to excuse or to accept that it is the right thing to do, but 
um, people would rather see their children safe than, you know, hear um, stories. And then coming to the issue of them missing out on school, I mean, we all know that education, I mean, the role of education cannot be overemphasized, you know, in terms of importance. And let's not forget, even before this crisis, if we're to look at Nigeria historically, the North, I mean, in terms of index of achievement, education-wise would have the lowest um, scoring, I mean, would be on the lowest scale if we were to group it that way. So this will only deepen the crisis and the problem you know, in terms of what is going to happen. And a lot of them will probably never catch up with um, school again. And unfortunately, especially looking at it from the aspect of uh, the females or the girls, you know, well, with the culture in the North, this would mean for some, would that be the end of school? Would they get married off? So it has quite a far reaching, um, you know, it, there's quite far reaching effects beyond just what will happen now and maybe missing out on a few classes. You know, this is something that will carry on and will only further make the North um, educationally um, backwards poor. It's difficult to also say, well, should you leave them in school and then they get attacked because you don't want them to miss out? You know, these are difficult decisions which, you know, we shouldn't have gotten to this point, but we are where we are, as the vice president will say, and, you know, something has to be done. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Haruna. My, my follow up question to that, because I, I think you raised the important point that. Uh, the North has always been lagging behind in educational indices, and this will make things worse. So what are the, what, what, what do you think are the solutions? Because on the one hand, yes, there's a need to secure the place, but on the other hand, schools cannot be shot indefinitely. So do you know what the people in the region themselves, what, what are they thinking? Like what, what do they, what would they propose as a, as a solution to the problem? Well, um, I think we have to look at it um, this way, that obviously we have to think of short-term and long-term solutions, isn't it? Some short-term solutions people could think about is maybe, um, I mean, we're looking those students into maybe the safer areas. So like the state capitals, for example, are usually safer than some of the places where schools are shut down, you know, like outside of the state capital. So that could be a short-term solution, but ultimately it's about, you know, the long-term securing the, place and I think it's also what saying that um you know states like Borno had the Boko Haram issue for quite a long time but places like the university the polytechnics and so many schools were open all through that period but because they are sort of located in this within the state capital and you know the safer regions and then maybe if you go to states like Adamawa schools you have schools like Abti and you know they they have two other universities there and they've been relatively safe so because they are in more sort of populated areas with some security um, operatives guarding those places. So one of the things I would say is in the short term, yes, if there is an imminent attack that we don't know about and there are issues that we you know, may not have information about, then one sh um, quick solution would be to try to relocate these students I don't know how practical and how easy it would be. I mean, logistic wise also, you know, cause you have to then move people, what about their families and things like that. But that may be a, you know, a sort of short term solution just so that they don't miss out on this, um, you know, on education. But in terms of the longer term, you have to secure the area. And I think it's worth saying that maybe we are gradually beginning to see a shift in, terms of like, um, I will use my state, Borno state, for example. And I mean, I think you will all bear witness that there, we, we don't hear as much information about, you know, attacks and things like that as it was in the past. And perhaps like um, Phoenix alluded to earlier, maybe there is more presence of military activities and it's gradually, you know, reducing the um, effects of these things. And I think it's also worth saying that, um, Maybe it's um, one of the things you should also see finally is that maybe they these groups doing these things have sort of changed their modus of operation. So in the past, they were attacking people, just killing and destruction. But now it seems kidnapping is more what they are into. And firstly, school children, they can ca catch, I mean, I don't want to use the word, they can take a lot of people in one go, which makes it even more lucrative. So these are some of the challenges we have to um, face. Thank you. Thank you, Harina. Um, the I think you're right. The 
choices are, are very, very, very difficult. Uh, and we just, at this stage, we just have to hope and pray that uh, somehow the security situation in, in, in the North improves so that our young children can go to schools. But onto our second topic, um, President Buhari has decided to fire two of his ministers. Uh, first of all, he sacked the power minister, Sally Maman, and he also sacked the agriculture minister. Um, I like his name, Mr. Nano No. Mr. Nano No, Nano No. Yes, I, I like his name. Um, so, firstly, to Phoenix, what's going on? Why were Mr. Sally and Mr. Nano No uh, fired? Well, <clears throat> the the uh, what would I call it? The public statement put out by the presidency on behalf of President Buhari was that uh, they did some sort of review and they decided to strengthen the weak areas of his government so that they will focus on and make changes that will focus on legacy projects. I guess our man. <laughs> with with less than two years left, is now thinking legacy, which is quite amusing to me. I mean, you spend uh, three quarters of your time in office practically destroying the country, and then you wake up take less than a quarter of a way to go and start thinking legacy. Well, that's what they said. But then what, what was even more hilarious was to watch um, uh, Adishino, you know, the president's spokesperson, try to contort himself into all sorts of different shapes to um, walk back the weak link part of the public statement he himself put out, trying to say that, oh, the president did not say the people's buffer, the, the two men um, had given weak performance and that's why they were fired. No, that they were, they were trying to reinvigorate and you know, all this blah, 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 they say to try and make, uh, make things look good and end up uh, making making it worse. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, it is no gain saying that uh, agriculture and uh, and power have not done well under this particular president. I mean, we remember, um, I mean, the first minister he put in place for agriculture, Aldobe, and his foibles. Um, he of the one, if I remember correctly, who wanted to go and import grass, was it from Brazil for, for cattle or something funny like that, and all sorts of nonsensical things that he that kept coming out of his head. And so when he replaced him with Nanunu, who uh, nobody had any knowledge of, uh, almost, almost, I was looking for a pawn to put in there, but one thing can't go quickly. <laughs> but, but it was clearly a no-no for for Buhari at the end of the day. And uh, um, I mean, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, there, there was there was nothing there. You weren't getting any any positivity out of out of either men. So changing them for me changes nothing. And then you look to who is changed them with. Um, the, the person who's gone into Agric has a lot of government experience, seems well, I mean, very well read, uh, was the former Minister for Environment. I don't know if that makes any difference, but I mean, on paper, looks to be a better candidate, so we'll see. But it also shows that he is a Buharist to the core, so it could also be a consolidation play because he's. Uh, I mean, it could be a political move in the last uh, two years of the Buhari presidency. Again, legacy being a word. The question is what type of legacy? Um, and the guy going into power, I mean, when they put Saleh into power, I mean, if, the only remarkable thing about it was that the power was being taken away from uh, Mr. Super Minister himself after clearly under underwhelming performance. And uh, Saleh, came in, really there was nothing to build on and he's also been a joke as far as I'm concerned. So bringing in this new chap, um, I forget his name now, uh, we'll see what he's able to achieve. I mean, you know, these are two core ministries. If I look at Buhari's uh, mandate and, and 
things that you would have expected him to take seriously and to try to drive forward. Agriculture is a big part of what he keeps singing, telling people to go back to farming, then blah, blah, blah. But he, 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 they, I mean, he has appointed people who clearly could not move agriculture forward for all the focus that he put on it. It's, it's amazing to me that someone who thinks agriculture is that, is that important continues to put in round pegs in square holes. I mean, you, just, you only have to go back six years to the, to the person who was Minister for Agriculture just before Buhari came, in, came on board. Look at what that guy did before, of course, he left with the government that he served. And look at where that guy has gone since then. You know, it, it's incredible. So if, if you are going to come in and say agriculture is important, and you're going to replace someone like that with the clowns that you've put in place, it clearly shows you don't know what you're doing. Then you go to power. For me, it was always clear that where we were in 2015, I mean, bearing in mind some of the work that had happened that had been done before 2015, that power was the last big conquest for, for the Nigerian government to you know, take its hands off, really set in a good place and let this country move forward if we're truly going to move forward. These guys came in, first of all, gave it to Fashola. He fumbled and, and was just a joke. They, they, they chained things over and they still couldn't get anything to move. And power has gone back significantly since 2015. So this change that he's made for me achieves nothing. It's, it's, it just shows that, I mean, if you put people in two years ago and you're, you're firing them now midway, when we know that in the first term, you let people serve out their terms, just an admission that even after having four years in government, you did not know how to choose the right people to drive your agenda forward if you had any agenda at all. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's just ridiculous where things are, but that's, that's what you get out of the current administration. Thank you, Phoenix. Um, I, li I like that pun, yes. Nanonu was a no-no for Buhari. So on to uh, Osa. I know you're, you're a politico. So I'm trying to understand how did, because it, it's very strange that after six years in office and it's sort of universally acknowledged that uh, Buhari has a shambolic uh, cabinet, why did he suddenly identify those two as the ones who he felt were the weakest link? Were they really worse than the other ministers in his cabinet? Or was there another underlying reason that we're not, we're not aware of, Jose? So um, because I'm a politician, I view things in political cycles. Um, and we are right now, um, as evidence, I think, by the next story we're going to talk about, we're right now at the starting line of um, the political process that will determine who occupies office in 2023. And almost every decision that happens now, <clears throat> I think should be viewed in that prism. So I, I think uh, Nanona was from Kano um, and the new guy that represent, that replaces him. Um, I think he's also from Kano. And I suspect that, that what we are seeing isn't a consideration about um, performance, but I think you sort of are seeing um, a realignment of the president's team into a, a, a team that can help him, into a campaign team, a campaign council. I think that's, that's what you sort of, uh, you sort of will be, will be seeing um, a bit more and more. Um, so maybe if moving forward, it, it, it's more of a measure of loyalty and the ability to uh, maybe win votes or to command and control resources that will be the determining factor in who stays and who goes. Um, and, and I do feel bad for Nanono. Um, uh, yes, I do agree he was colorless and incompetent, but you know he, he sort of was hit with two, two blows that you know he had no control over. He was hit with insecurity in the Northeast and uh, the Northwest and the Middle Belt, the North Central that kept farmers away from the farms. I'm from Edo State, and farmers in Edo State are not going to the farm because um, of armed men in the forests. You know, so, you know, when, when you sort of are 
uh, hamstrung in this is in this way, productivity, you know, will inevitably drop, and and it's sort of is difficult to hold him accountable for that. And the second thing was the COVID, um, you know, the, the, the hit we all took from COVID. Again, it, it depressed everything, every sector last year, um, because people were not even allowed to get to the farms all of last year. So, you know, when you look at um, GDP figures, invariably you will see a, a, you know, a, a downward trend, you know, and, and, I, and I feel for him, um, it just sort, sort of is unfortunate that he was the, the person at the helm um, of affairs, you know, when these two blows hit. Um, the other guy, Saleh Maman, um, Maman Saleh, <laughs> um, you know, you, 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 you need to go back, I think, to um, Fashola's statement where he says, you know, if you know what you're doing in three months or six months, was it you can sort out Nigeria's um, power problems, you know, and I sort of suspect that, you know, they never got a hang of the scale and complexity of, of Nigeria's power problems. Um, so I had no expectation for um, Mr. Maman when he took over from Sally, from Fashola, who was heads and shoulders more competent than, than he would ever be, or he could ever be, um, but had still failed. Um, so we, we won't, I don't expect we'll see any, any any progress? I don't. I don't think um, if the president was really looking to improve the sectors, I don't think he would have fished from his similarly clueless and incompetent uh, cabinet to get replacements. I, I think he would have looked outwards. Um, but like I said, you know, you sort of are now, you know, adopting a, a war posture, uh, which is what Nigerian campaigns sort of like tend to to look like, and um, you know. It, it, it's it, it's it's unfortunate, and it, it's maybe a failing of this uh, uh, electoral system where, you know, in your second term, in the president's second term, you do two years and then governance stops. Um, so that's what's going to happen. That's what is happening. Um, and we can just, I think, just look forward to, you know, a very fractious, very um, polarizing, um, campaign season. Well, thank you, Osses. So from what you're suggesting, these appointments had more to do with politics than actual performance. But I want to bring in Haruna because Haruna, I, I know you're a psychiatrist. So there's an element of Nigerian politics I'm trying to understand. Because there were newspaper reports that as soon as uh, Mr. Sally, the power minister, as soon as his sacking was announced, he suddenly took ill and had to be lodged in hospital. And then he relocated to a hotel to recover. And then he issued a statement also claiming that, yes, it's true. He was in a hotel recovering, but it was for a different reason. But what I'm trying to understand, Haruna, is what is it about losing public office that suddenly causes people to collapse or have to go to hospital? Like, what's the problem? <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. That's quite a funny and interesting story. Uh, I think people have said <laughs> the man collapsed after he had the news for, uh, he, like you clearly said, he's uh, sort of said, well, he was already unwell before it happened. But I think the news shocked him more than he expected because he was, I don't think he was consulted before he was sacked, uh, isn't it? He also had the news like all of us, maybe on the TV or radio, and that can bring um, something shock. But coming back to medical terms, obviously, when you, when people hear, if you want us to look at things from a medical perspective as to why people collapse after they hear um, a news, that's what we call um, like the um, sort of psychogenic shock, isn't it? Because it's like a shock to the system. The body just goes into a sort of meltdown and chemical changes take place and the person's you know blood supply reduces to the brain and that's why people collapse when they hear sudden news as such you know but yeah obviously so that's from a medical point of um, view but I think a lot of these politicians you would say don't leave us I mean I'll say it's here so I mean you may correct me if I'm wrong but so many of them like the Nigerian big politicians don't so, I mean, they, they, they go into politics or into whatever elections or into offices with the hope that, well, we've been appointed, we'll continue for longer, we will win this election and 
we we don't expect otherwise otherwise they won't even go into it in the first place and when that news comes to them that they've lost or they've been sucked then this uh, psychogenic shock sort of hits in because you know those things are not what they've expected so that's sort of the kind of um, medical name for it uh, which is called fainting or things like that you know but 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 I think, I don't know if this minister was expecting it, because if you look at his statement again, he will tell you he was in a hotel, he was recovering from an illness, and he also had the news, you know, like all of us, but, you know, so, yeah, so maybe for politicians, just know that um, you're not un you are not untouchables, and maybe you should always prepare yourself that such news can come in, and that's why sometimes people, you know, break this kind of news to them in the we have we call it breaking bad news you know you break it in phases you know just little little just sort of preempts you know maybe to say something like let me use a common nigerian phrase like oh oh God, this election is not going like we expected or something you know and uh the way it's going it doesn't seem as if we'll win at least you are gradually making the person aware at least increasing their heart rate and things like that rather than just them seeing that they've lost election and then they don't know how to respond or to react and then they end up fainting but yeah thank you thank you Harina. but my, my follow-up to that i suppose okay yes we, we understand the uh thank you for the, I, I i see the scientific aspects and i understand obviously when you get bad news but for the ordinary person, you, you, you faint when you hear maybe your wife or your sister or your child is ill. But what is it about and why is losing office in Nigeria a fainting issue? Is it, isn't public pol politics supposed to be about service? Why should you faint because you hear you're no longer a minister? Well, um, I think we have to be practical and really looking at our political um, system and know that for us, it's about source of livelihood, it's about income, it's about wealth, it's about power, it's about influence when you're in office. I mean, I'll tell you a very interesting story. Like, um, you know, my dad used to work in the Nigerian Airways in the past, and he was quite high up there. So he said one day they were in the um, MD's house, you know, just in the evening, you know, it's always filled up with people, everyone visiting. And at nine o'clock, um, I think it was, I don't know if it was Babangida then who was president. And anyway, they, they had announced that they'd sacked the MD. He said within five minutes, everyone had left the house and it was empty. And the man was in shock, like, ah, what's happening? He hadn't even heard the news, but everyone had left him, you know, just by himself. So you can see in that instance, he's lost the whole influence. All the people that were there celebrating and, you know, enjoying his company had within just a minute of an announcement had left him to himself you know so that's just on maybe the personal aspect of you lose that affluence you lose friends and let's not forget monetary terms it's a huge loss and that's why you see so many people not just the politicians i would say when maybe they leave government office i'm using nigerian context um, specific you see, you see that it seems their life just changes suddenly that big man that had everything flying all over the world had so much money and then he retires after like six months and you're like wow this man can't even afford a decent holiday or a decent car or something, you know? So it's a complete change. So it comes with loss. And I think that's the shock. And that's why people find it hard to recover, especially if they've not prepared for it. Thank you. So let, let's let's hope that uh, if, if Ose goes into government, he doesn't uh, get going to a, a, a medical shock as well if he's removed from office. So. Uh, We'll say, I hope, hope it doesn't happen to you too. <laughs> I hope not. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> because that would be quite, they also has collapsed because they changed cabinets. Yes, yeah, so to our final topic, yes, Uche Secondus of the PDP. Um, Phoenix, there have just been bits and pieces of news about the PDP in in in, uh, in 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 the in the news this this past few weeks something seems to be going on there's a fight i know all we can seem to push peace together is uche secondus is at war with somebody i think near some week the governor of river state about his tenure he he's gone to court to say his tenure should end in december 2021 but it seems there's a faction of the party that wants him to leave now so can you talk us through what what is really going on with the pdp why is the tenure of uche secondus such a big issue. I think it's a good thing that we have uh, Usa here. So 
I will defer to him on the internal rankings. I only speak on what I can see from the outside. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the the I mean, Secondos' issue is, seems to primarily be with Wiki, who clearly wants him out of that uh, uh, chairmanship uh, seat. Uh, Secondos has survived for much longer than I expected him to, and I thought that the PDP would allow him to. Um, I, 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 don't, I never thought it was the right fit for that party, and uh, and I thought it was just emblematic of the malaise that PDP had found itself in once it was out of power, and, and even before it left power, when, <sighs> to my mind, the, the issue started with when when some of when those governors all that MPDP story went ahead to go and form APC and they let that happen and it all just spiraled into a secondos taking over the party and since then you've had one challenge after the other and and, and in that time Wiki has become more and more influential such that he now wants a, a party chairman of his own liking and and doesn't want uh, secondus anymore to be in that office and so they've 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 been trading court um, lawsuits and uh, i mean there was a panel put together led by david mark which was supposed to broker peace um, and uh, wiki gave his conditions for peace which of course included <laughs> uh, secondus um, stepping aside from all positions of authority uh, Secondos pushed back on that, and, uh, and they've been all been they've been going back and forth. So I mean, it remains to be seen where it all lands. But I think it it's really it, it's 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 a crisis that they don't need. Um, less than two years to elections in a time where they've I mean where they've practically been handed an opportunity on a plateau go by a desperately incompetent um, APC government and with people clearly disillusioned with the APC government, um, you would expect that the PDP will take advantage, but they they can't help but stand in their own way and uh, and continue the internal wrangling which makes, which gives fodder to some of these uh, jokers that then liken both parties to one another, but I don't even want to get into that debate. It's nonsensical. But what's most important is, I mean, if there's going to be any proper opposition, now that they now that I mean, we expect that Buhari will no longer be on the ticket, so that mystique that that, that probably helped the APC won't be there. Then the PDP needs to get its act together, and they need to to find the right leadership. They need to also bring an, you know, some wiki under control because he's not the kind of guy you want to be representing your party and for people to, to see as the dominant voice of that party. I mean, he's going to rub it up people off the wrong way. So for me, it doesn't help them at all. Um, but neither did I ever think that Secondos was, the, was a chairman that could lead the PDP to glory. So they need to go sort out their internal wahala if they want to be in any shape to to compete come 2023. But it's a shame really, as far as I'm concerned, that they let things get to this pass. Thank you, Phoenix. Um, also, yes, you're, you're on the hot seat now because I'm trying to understand with the PDP. Um, since 1999 that I've been following Nigeria's democratic politics, there always seems to be a problem with your party and their party chairman. After every two years, somebody wants the party chairman out. Now, in this case, and it always seems to be the same, the, 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 the person who wants the chairman out is the same person who appointed the chairman in the first place. Now, I remember that we came, fought everybody and insisted that Uche Sekondus should be the chairman, even though a lot of party members said it should be the Southwest that produces the chairman, but we came insisted on Sekondus. So what is happening now that we can now want Secondus out? Jose. So um, just, just a bit of uh, historical housekeeping. Um, Secondus came in December 2017, I think. And yes, he was Wiki's candidate. And yes, there sort of was like an understanding that the Southwest should produce a chairman. 
But what happened at, at that convention was that we had about four or five um, candidates from the Southwest, if I recall, and then we only had um, seconders from the South South. So, you know, when we went to the votes with usual politicking and the rest, you know, the Southwest votes were split between their uh, multiple candidates and seconders emerged, seconders as weakest candidate emerged. Um, I just want to just um, point that out that it wasn't that he insisted and nobody could could tell him no. I, I think he just played uh, smart uh, politics. Um, the problem I have personally, um, not with not with Secundus's uh, person, but I think just you know I spoke about um, the APC getting into war formation and the type of politics we play. Um, Secondus reminds me of Ano Yegun, um, a gentleman, you know, you know calm, um, you know, taciturn. But Nigerian politics doesn't really respond to that type of of um, opposition leadership. Um, so you saw in the PC they got rid of of um, Oyegun and you know brought in Oshomole, who did his job. You know, but immediately after they won, became unfit for the type of leadership role you would require from a victorious or a ruling party's chairman. Um, so, so I, I think that sort of, you know, is the perception that Secondo suffered suffered from. He was he was under the poison chalice, um, you know, just from you know, just like uh, Phoenix said, the perception that was that he was weakest candidate. So he was always going to get resistance from people who felt Wicked shouldn't be lording it over the party. Um, but when he fell out with Wiki, um, you, you then sort of like start, start getting this pushback, I think, from people who were saying, but hang on, he was your candidate. Um, you know, you can't just unilaterally uh, remove him. Um, but the good thing about the PDP, regardless of the, you know, the internal, crisis we that that um, we we sort of uh, run into uh, occasionally that we we do we, we know how to resolve um, problems the the issue in particular with secondus was that you know people didn't want him to run for a second term if he was going to oversee the the convention it would almost be like being a judge in your own case you know and they were like there's no way you 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 be an umpire in an election you're going to take part in um, so they wanted to get a commitment from him that he won't run for a second term and they also wanted the convention move forward just so they get it uh, behind us and there was an agreement reached by the party by the bot by the expanded caucus by the governor's forum um, that Secondus will be allowed to finish his tenure. The convention will be brought, brought forward to October, and but Secondus will not run for a second term. When we started seeing these um, court cases flying up and down was when apparently Secondus tried to renege on that agreement. Um, to be clear, uh, you cannot suspend the national chairman from your ward. Uh, I think it was just it, it was it was just a gambit that people went into to try to secure a court uh, uh, injunction, which they did. Um, so I think what Rivers at first secured one, then uh, Kebby um, Secondus got one from 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 Kebby reinstalling him as chairman, and then someone else got another one from Calabar removing him once again as our national chairman. Um, again, to be clear, you cannot suspend your national chairman from the ward. Um, I, I believe Secondus, I, I hear he has gone on appeal. I believe he will vacate these injunctions. The, 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 but the problem is that, or not the problem, the good thing is that NEC has already met and sat and decided that the convention will take place on October 30th and 31st. So that, that main bone of contention, I think, has been has been um, resolved by the party. And, and it sort of, I think, is, is indicative almost of an, an understanding within the party that you know, there is an opportunity to, to, to win back power. And so these jostlings are just, I, I, I believe, the ambitions of um, actors within the party who wants to sort of like be in the driving seat 
um, as we as we get into um, 2023 campaign season proper. Um, it's been resolved. It's unfortunate. Um, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm happy about it. I also think it needs mentioning that the judiciary has been has acted disgracefully in the way and manner they've been issuing out these um, um, ex parte injunctions like confetti. Um, they are part of the problem. Politicians will always exploit weaknesses in the system. And I was very happy to see the NBA take a position on this. I was surprised but impressed to see the CGN also call these judges um, to a meeting. So hopefully, um, like with all democratic processes, what will come out of this will be a, a more robust uh, system, um, especially with, with, where, uh, with regards to the judiciary. Um, so people just won't be, you know, taking advantage advantage of things like this. But I am not concerned uh, for the party. Um, I, I'm happy to be resolved. I think we'll have a very, very competitive um, convention and a very, very competitive presidential primary um, election. I always ask people, you know what, if you, if you want power to rotate to the north, to the south, to the east, to the west, or you want to pick your candidate, PDP is going to be doing direct primaries. So join the party so that you can be a, take part in the selection of these candidates. You know, not that after candidates emerge, you now start complaining. Join the party and take back part in the process. Uh, sorry about the plug, but it, it, need to be, it needed to be said. Well, thank you, sir. But this, this uh, party political message you've uh, put out doesn't seem to be tallying with the, with the facts because you're saying it has been resolved and the national executive committee said uh, it will be um, his tenure would end in october but near uh, secondus went to court it was reported in the news that he's gone to court today to ask the appeal court to declare that his tenure ends in december not october so if he went to court today to seek that declaration it, it doesn't quite add up when you say they've resolved the issue, does it? So when he, what he prayed in court was, um, like I said, rightfully so that the world cannot suspend him. It has to come to neck. And the, because he's not suspended, his tenure um, expires in December. He's also correct in that. But neck can move, can set a date for the convention at any time. And neck has set the date for the convention on the 30th and 31st so until the court I, I believe he'll he'll get judgment from the appeal court when that happens he'll become chairman we will hold our convention and then once that happens once that happens his tenure expires so you know you know he's i think he's just been it, it's a it's a legal case he's arguing in court he has every right to argue that case um but for me i think as long as you know the convention date isn't moved then there really isn't any any issue it's gone beyond um, the title he wants to put on his door. Thank you, sir. Although this your explanation doesn't seem to be to be adding up to me, but uh, time will tell to see if it's true that the issue in the PDP has been resolved. Now to Haruna. Haruna, obviously you're a political. You're not. You're neither APC nor PDP. So perhaps you can give us a fresh perspective. In your view, looking at the the PDP, does do they look like a party? You know, Osa says they're, they're, that he's excited that they are ready to take power in 2023. In your view, does the PDP look like a party that is ready to take power, Haruna? Okay, well, um, I think um, what I'll say is, and, and thank you for clarifying that my political status is that they, what I will say is, um, I mean, we've seen time and time since um, Return of Democracy that we've had sort of two big parties, isn't it? Uh, and power has sort of rotated between the PDP and now the APC after much um, changes. And for me, as a neutral, I would say I'm a bit um, disappointed with the PDP. I mean, I know says here, so you can maybe respond to that because they haven't shown that sort of what you would expect from opposition. Like when APC was an opposition, we knew there was always, you know, something to show that these guys were doing everything to get into power. I'm not saying I like their ways or I agree with their methods, but it was clear that they 
wanted power, even though we know they didn't really know what they were going to do with it. But to me, it seems as if PDP is just so much fighting in between that they are not really making a lot of um you know the noise we should expect from opposition against the APC and it seems more of infighting or secondos versus wiki although he's the one that put him there so it seems very it just makes it feel as if if you can't get your art together in house would you be even um even be able to stand when the time comes we wouldn't I mean, I'm just hoping it wouldn't be a situation where it would be like the case of Zamfara State, where you will end up presenting candidates and then they will say, well, they were, he wasn't he or she wasn't supposed to be the candidate. And then we, we you have no candidates at the end of the day. So for me, from a neutral perspective, I think I'm a bit disappointed with the way things are going. And um, I mean, I don't, you know, I haven't seen what I've, I will expect from an opposition party. Thank you. Um, oh, sir, um, we we have about two minutes to go. So, do, are you able to respond to that? Haruna said you guys have not sold him a vision, but your party is ready for power. Do do you agree? Um, so, uh, because this is the uh, this is Nigeria Politics Weekly, I can be honest. This is a safe space. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I will I will say two things, um, Haruna. So in, so. Yes, I hear what you say about an expectation from an opposition party to um, provide um, leadership that gives hope. Um, I, I, and I concede to a certain uh, to a certain degree that you know maybe in some aspects that leadership um, or that leader that ambition has has been sort of, of sort of lacking. Uh, I'll concede that. But I also will say I also will stress that. When you hear reference to the type of opposition APC played in in 2015, you know I always stress that that was the the worst type of opposition any party could play. They corrupted the media, they they corrupted um, civil society. They ran with lies and propaganda and made it um, their truth and and, and our reality. Um, they sabotaged government. They 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 demoralized and discredited the military. That's not the type of, of opposition we want to play, even if it costs us the election. I think you know, nationhood or nation building is, is, is more important to me personally. Um, so you know, I will say I hear you. I, I think we can do better. I don't think we, we are perfect. Um, and I know, you know internally we are working on reforming ahead of the elections, um, but I, I would just urge you to not hold us to the type of uh, standard that the APC set in 2015, because that type of opposition, if you played it, I think would 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 um, destroy Nigeria. We are, we look around Africa, and we see states literally falling. Military is intervening. Uh, militants are taking over. Nigeria, I always say, is on the precipice right now. Buhari has led us to the precipice, and you know I would urge you not to not to encourage opposition um, political parties to play the type of incendiary politics that the APC played. We, would, we can do better, we will do better, but it has to be responsible. Um, are you the mic? <laughs> Thank you, Ose. Um, our time is up, but before we go, um, I'd like to first of all thank our listeners for always being loyal. And then I'll thank our two guests. Thank you, Ose, and thank you, Haruna, for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. And thank you, Phoenix, for co-hosting this podcast with me. And until same time next week, as here, have a fantastic seven days to everyone. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Aruna, and thanks also for joining us. Uh, thank you, listeners, for, for sticking with us all this time. Again, uh, I've started my countdown towards the anniversary, as I said last week, of uh, the Lekki massacre and all that came before and and has been after it, so it will be definitely top of mind. Um, have a great week, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I just want to say um, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure, um, and there's no such thing as a little genocide. <laughs> Don't get us started. <laughs>